the hybrid cows. Yeah, so they say the Maasai, 10 mile corridor for the Maasai to pass with their Shenzhen Ngombis to go down to Narok and, and Kajiato. <laughs> uh, but then uh, uh, these uh, the people in these areas are basically in the rural areas are, are farmers. And, um, but in order to for this to be sustainable, you need first to deal with the issues of inputs. Here, yeah. the seeds, the fertilizers, and the pesticides are some of the things, the major in inputs that you need to look at to make this thing viable. Secondly, you need to look at issues of access to the market and then the issues of, uh, of, of pricing, which actually depends on supply and demand. Then, uh, um, when I was there, and the governor, he arranged for me to meet with the, the um, Traders, you see, the these traders, the MSMEs, the small and medium uh, enterprises, and he has done a wonderful job in promoting these micro, small, and medium enterprises. They are big, as he already told you the figures, and uh, is empowering them give them access to capital and also helping them access the markets. So I was very impressed by the de degree of inno innovation by those young Kenyans. Um, the kind of machinery that they produce. They find, for example, a machine that is being used to recycle plastic waste and to make cabros out of the, the, the plastic waste and several other building materials are made out of it. Cattle feeds and things like that, so many other things. So I was very, very impressed. So there's really no need to invent the wheel. We know that uh, these SMEs can eventually grow and become bigger enterprises. I told him that, you know, I am an engineer by profession. And I gave them examples of how many of these enterprises started as very small enterprises. I gave them the example of Mr. Mr. You know, Carl Calhans Benz. He was an engineer doing experiments with uh, First two-stroke, then a four-stroke cylinder engine. He developed it, then eventually built a, a, a chassis, put it on the chassis, and um, put a transmission system so that it could convert the motion from the engine to the wheels. And then he started driving it. It was ta -ta 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 and people feared it. He asked people to come on with him when he was doing the first experiment, nobody wanted. Eventually his 17-year-old daughter agreed to go with the daddy. And they rode for 35 kilometers, then he stalled. Then later on, named that model after his daughter, who had agreed to risk her life to go with him. The daughter was called Mercedes. That is the story of Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> the man was called Karl Heinz Benz. But that's why it is sometimes we call it Mercedes-Benz. The daughter was called Mercedes. And eventually now, Mercedes 
became a household name. The same thing when Mercedes was doing, Benz was doing the experiment in Germany, next to him, not far away, another person was also doing experiment, it was called Daimler. Eventually, Daimler and Benz came together. That's why sometimes it's called Daimler Benz. But at the same time, also Mr. Henry Ford, on the other side of Atlantic, was also doing experiments with a, a, a four-cylinder engine. He did the same thing like what Benz had done and put it on a chassis. Again, nobody wanted. He called it Ford T, T model. Nobody wanted to get into it. Women were quoted as saying that those crazy contraptions of Mr. Ford, no way. I'm safer on a horseback in a day. People preferred the horse to the car. But eventually, that one of Mr. Mr. Ford also became uh, now an international model. Mr. Toyota was repairing car, uh, bicycles. Then he went into the scooter, assembling parts to make a scooter, which, you know, became the, 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 the motorbike for women. Then he started, went to the motorbike. Eventually, he went to the, a four-stroke cylinder, uh, cylinder engine, which became then a uh, Toyota. And uh, when Toyota was made in those days, you know, nobody wanted to buy Toyotas. When I was studying in Germany, Japanese cars were banned that they did not meet the German safety standards. The first Toyota that was brought in this country were lying in the warehouses here. Nobody was buying them. Till they went and convinced two politicians, Dr. Mikonyo Kiano and Mr. Joseph Murumbi. They gave them free cars to drive so people could trust. So, and that's how they managed to enter this market here. Today, the child is a household name internationally, all over the world. I was telling them also that when we were going to school, anything Japanese was known as inferior in quality. There was a, a, a cloth. If they made you a uniform with that cloth, which is called Japan, fellow uh, children in school would laugh at you. Uh, we went about to Japan. You had to buy where a stock port from England. Now, where Japan is seen as high quality. So, I was encouraging these people to say that we can also do it here. <laughs> we don't need to be ashamed of what is made here in, in Kenya. And we also need to, don't need to reinvent the wheel. We know where we are coming from. In the days of colonialism, Africans were excluded from economic activities of our country. They were, they were running a segregated society. There was a Mzungu, there was a Muhindi, then there was a Marabu, and then the African was down there, the lad. So if you are found with 100 shilling notes, you'll be arrested. Come Africa. So when the independence came, the government came up with a policies to mainstream Africans into the economy. Now they came up with a policy called Africanization. Africanization was meant to help Africans to participate effectively in the economy of this country. They set up institutions, the ICDC, Industrial and Commercial Development Corporation, the um, uh, KNTC, 
the Kenya National Trading Corporation. These institutions were tasked with the responsibility of giving Africans capital loan so that they could be able to participate meaningfully in the economy. They, later on, um, uh, I mean, Africanization was blamed as being racist. That was discriminating against other races. So it was changed to Kenyanization. Kenyanization. Then the government came up with a, a policy of um, many uh, to uh, take over, I mean, retail businesses. That if you are not a Kenyan citizen, you are not allowed to engage in retail businesses. You could be in manufacturing, wholesale, but retail businesses could only be done by uh, native Africans. That is the time, and that, that's when now, because there were some Indians. In colonial days, we were all British citizens or retaining their British citizenship. Most of them retained British citizenship. They were told that if you're not a Kenyan by, uh, I mean, a, a, a citizen, you cannot be engaged in retail businesses. And that is how Africans began to, to buy some of those Indian businesses, getting loans from KNTC and from ICDC. Then they also set up institutions here, like Kenya Industrial Estates was set up to help Africans to get into manufacturing. And that is how I became a, I myself became a beneficiary of the KIE process. I got a loan from ICDC to start my business. But how did I do it? I was then a teacher at the University of Nairobi, and there we had a, an, a, a technician who was an Indian called I.G. Desai. So one day I.G. Desai came to me and told me that, you know, there is a Kala singer who has been chased away from Uganda by Idi Amin, and he has he had a workshop in Jinja, and he has uprooted the machinery and he has brought them here. They are somewhere in a, a house in Parklands. He's trying to sell because he's going to UK. And me, he was an electrical engineer. I cannot do anything with them, but you are a mechanical one. I think you can get, make use of them. So he took me to the, this Indian place in Parklands. And then I looked at those machinery, the old sheet metal working machines, the, the guillotine, there was uh, the lathe machine, the milling machines, the welding sets, and so on. I said, yeah, these are good machines. They were, he was selling them for 12,000 shillings. I didn't have. My salary was 2,000 shillings a month. So, um, but I had a, a, a car I'd brought back left-hand driver, Opel Cadet, <laughs> which I sold, and I got the money to pay the car singer. <laughs> that became my staging capital. Then I took this machinery, and I went and hired a workshop on then called Kingston Road. It's now called Kampala Road in the industrial area. And then started making ideal casements, doors and windows and all those sort of things. I managed to get Kenyans who had also been sent away from Uganda, highly cool, skilled uh, manpower, whom I employed. That is how I started. Then eventually, I was enabled, I managed to, to get an order from an oil company, Ajib, to manufacture for them some cylinders, LPG cylinders for, for, for gas. And uh, after that, um, I, I met another German 
who was the German government had come up here to help Kenya set up Kenya Industrial Estates. Kenya Industrial Estates was meant to help Africans get into manufacturing. So when I met this German, he came and looked at what I was having. And then he said, look, we are trying to make uh, industries out of laymen. Here is somebody who knows what he's doing. This project of yours qualifies for funding under the KIE. And that is how I went now to the Kenya Industrial Estates as an expansion project. And I got a loan to now buy modern machinery and begin modern manufacturing. The rest is history, is, is history now. <laughs> Why am I saying this story? I'm just trying to say that the government at that time was committed to helping Africans. There was deliberate effort at that time to help Africans come up in businesses. And by the time the, the first regime was ending, there was an emergent African middle class in manufacturing, in banking, in insurance, and so on. These were basically killed later on through wrong policies and also the pressures from IMF and World Bank liberalization that killed very many businesses. But there was also an effort to try to promote foreign as opposed to local investment. So we've seen what long policies can do to a country. You can know how uh, the consequences of those wrong policies. Because when the first regime of Kenyatta we created a middle class, a middle class, a national bourgeois class was emerging. When the change came, they promoted what you call comprado class, briefcase business investment. Those who stand between capital and the no one who knows so and so, who knows so and so, who knows so and so. You want to register a company, a license. You want a manufacturing no, license. You need export license. For an exchange, you need license. So there are these briefcase people who they are the ones who know so and so, who will give you this and that and that and that. That is what happened. So local manufacturing, local economy was killed for 24 years, 24 years. When we came into government with Kibaki, we decided to change it. We came up, to, we found almost a bankrupt treasury. And we decided to, 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 to change it. And um, create an economy that was growing. The growth, the growth was negative when we came into government. We found the government was collecting 300 billion shillings. But then uh, it was a 500 billion shilling economy. The rest was coming from foreign donors all the time. Then we realized that, look, there was under collection because of corruption. And corruption. You find those who are involved in revenue raising were so corrupt. The revenue officers, the procurement officers, those are the boys in town. They're the ones driving the latest model of cars, the ones buying apartment blocks in town, the ones who are building castles in rural areas, the ones who are building high-rise buildings in village markets. So we said we do lifestyle audit. 
and we got all of them and removed them from the system and we brought in the right people. Within no time, revenue shot up. We, we did not have to raise taxes. We retained them, but the revenue shot from 300 billion to 750 billion. <laughs> we went to 900. On the third year, we are reached a trillion shilling budget. I remember John Michuki coming to Kibaki and saying, Mr. President, we are having for the first time a one trillion shilling budget. <laughs> and um, I was minister for roads. When we went in there, I came up with a road uh, construction program uh, throughout the country. I traveled all over the country looking at the roads. I found that there were 9,000 kilometers of tarmac roads in the country, but 46% of it was dilapidated. So I said, I need money to repair what has been left neglected, at the same time to construct new ones. I did not have the money, so I need more money. And I appealed for more money. The opposition, but Dr. Mohisa Kitui in the cabinet told them that, look, if you want to have an impact in this government, let's give Raila more money. So let us slash 5% from each budget and put it in roads, then we will have the impact. It was resolved, and that's how I got the money and started doing the roads. So uh, we planned, you will have seen uh, the roads around the country, you will look at the bypasses in this, this city. When I was knocking them down, knocking houses which had been built on the bypasses, I was being accused. Raida is targeting Kikuyu uh, uh, <laughs> property. They want to impoverish the Kikuyus, and so on. I said, no, we want, we want to decongest the city centre. And um, I was accused in the cabinet. I explained that, look, I told the chairman, Mr. President, this road reserves were declared as road reserves and gazetted in 1971. I came up with the gazette notices, and these people were compensated. But because no roads were constructed, they went and again and constructed, although they had been paid money by the government. But Mr. President, what we want to do is to decongest the city centre. Uh, the Uhuru Highway is a major barrier. Most of the traffic on Uhuru Highway is transit traffic from east, from south to, to, to west and vice versa, or east to, to west. This, tra this traffic has no business in the city center. So if you build the bypasses, the traffic from Mombasa going to western Kenya, Nakuru, Kisumu, Kampala, Rwanda, Burundi, and DRC, we will not need to come in through the, the city center and eastern bypass and then the northern bypasses and the link road. Then Kibaki says, Kama wato mijenga kwa barabara, ibamulewe. Oh yes, what do you want us to do? We have not want us to do. And Kibaki says, yeah, so Kibaki supported me. So I want you to know that we worked very closely with Mwai Kibaki. <laughs> the uh, but about the people, I have had discussions with them. In fact, they, they came to see me. I know their problem, and I also know the solution to their problem. And we have discussed it. <laughs> also.
also the I'm talked of SMEs and those who um, depend on importation of goods and so on. I know the problems that they're going through. I had a question to talk to them two weeks ago. And I promised that what they were requesting I was going to convey, and I've already conveyed it to the president. But going forward, we need to promote our own. We need to look at value addition. There are a lot of goods that we're producing here, but then we're exporting raw materials. We need to do value addition to our raw materials before we export them. And also, instead of importing, we need to promote more and more local manufacturing. This is the key to economic takeoff. If you go this day to the industrial area, what used to be manufacturing companies producing goods which were employing 300, 500 people have been turned into warehouses, towing containers from China. We are exporting a labor to China and we're having 39% of our workforce, of our eligible people, are unemployed. Because we have exported our labor to, to, to China. If you take the textile industry, we used to have Rivertex in Eldred, Kikomi in Kisumu, Raymond in Nakuru, Montex in Nanyuki, even thicker, Titex. All that is gone. So now we are basically depending on Mitumba. This, we can have uh, tailoring businesses here making, making goods which can be sold locally. So the people who are just selling Mitumba can actually get involved in selling the goods which are made in Kenya. This is another, another way of, 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 of developing our country. Then, uh, um, but let me talk about the youth. Because the youth are the engine of growth of an economy. I say the youth are the flowers of an, uh, of an economy or a country. But I also tell them that, you know, the difference between the young and the aged is just one. That the, the aged were one time young. So they know what it means to be a youth. But the youth have never been old. So they don't know how to be old. <laughs> what it means to be old. The difference between them is what is called experience, which is very important. We need experience. But we need to empower our youth. They have already said that 75% of our population is below the age of 35. That can be either a blessing or a curse, depending on how you look at it. If you do not empower that youth, they become delinquents, drug addicts, criminals, and therefore they are a drag on society. But if they imparted the requisite skills, then they become a motive force for growth and development. You are talking about the illicit, illicit drinks still being brewed. If there are no customers, they will not, be, they will not have a market, those people brewing it. So if those youth who are empowered will not go and drink those dirty things, they will go for good things. We'll be looking at 17-year-old, or 18-year-old, how they call them. 
18 year old uh, Glenn Fiddish. <laughs> but because that is what they can afford, that's why they go, they go for it and it's unhealthy for them. So the most important thing is to empower the youth. And this is, requires that we change gear. We look at how we empower youth right from the nursery school, high, primary school, secondary, tertiary, education, and high school and university. So that the, the youth are imparted with the skills. Because if you do that, then they become a motive force for growth and development. This is what a country like China has done. China invested money in skills development. They trained a highly skilled young force. So at the time they, they liberalized their economy, they became a very attractive investment destination. People are rushing to China because people are skilled and, and labor is cheap there in China. So China became all of a sudden the factory of the world. Most of manufacturing companies move to China. Samsung, LG, you come to Ford, Mercedes. Peugeot, Volvo, BMW, Toyota, Hyundai, they're all there in China. They manufacture in China and then export. You'll find, you'll be surprised that a DT Dobby, you're buying a Mercedes Benz, you think it's coming from Germany, this is coming from China. In Germany, they tell me that, look, it is cheaper to manufacture a Mercedes Benz in China ship it back to Germany than the one that is made in Stuttgart. So, but in that period, 30 years, China managed to move 300 million people from poverty to middle income status. The China today has got the biggest middle income population in the world. But China is no longer the cheapest destination. As the society has become more and more affluent, a gap has developed down there because they become more and more expensive. A gap which is down there is a gap which a country like Kenya can fill. <laughs> and we fill it by having, by investing in skills development, requisite skills. I was telling people some time today that you have today so many of people in our labor force working with certificates, qualified degrees. Then there are very many other investors who have come here looking for people to employ. But they're not getting people, the right people to employ. In other words, the skills that we have do not match the demand of the market. I mean, it's a location. So somebody is running around here, uh, oh, I've got a degree in uh, public relations. Uh, the other one, I don't know, I've got a degree in, um, there's some very funny professions, and here yeah, that somebody has got a degree in those. So th there's no, no company that is uh, needing those sort of people. So we need to align our training to the demands of the market. So uh, now the women, our women folk, is again our major resource in the country. We cannot develop without empowering our women. A country where only one half of the population is working cannot expect to compete with a country where the hundred percent of the population working. Because the women become a drag to the society. Women don't want to be dependent on you as a husband. 
Women are people who are capable and able to work on their own. So we empower our women to make them equal to our men. So that they become partners in our society. This is what we want. They mention a number of things which affect society generally. They talked about water. It also affects men. But most of the times, in many societies, women are the ones who have to go to fetch it from very far away. You need that water for food consumption. You need water for irrigation. And that you need to invest in harvesting. There are many parts of the country where you find drought. But when it rains, there's a lot of flooding. And that water is get wasted. It's allowed to run into rivers. Rivers take it to the sea, which does not need water. The sea does not need water. So we harvest that water and keep it for our people. And we can do it. It can be done with proper de de determination and a proper investment. So we will empower our women properly so that they can. And security. There can be no development in a country without security. This goes without saying that each and every Kenyan is equal. No po uh, people of Kenya live here at the invitation of any other community. <laughs> Kenya is ours as of right. So the government must protect each and every Kenyan. Every life matters. You are the governor of, of uh, uh, like keep your talk. What's happening? Those are the sort of things which you just look at, you, 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 ex you expect to see in a primitive society, in a civilized society. So those are the kind of things that we first and foremost we must get rid of and ensure that they don't happen and each and every Kenyan has the right to live in any part of the country, own property uh, uh, and invest there. I was being told that yes, I was yesterday with some people from uh, Kitali and they're saying that they fear to invest there because they're all the time a constant threat that you can be evicted any time. Those are things that we don't want to hear. Either you are a Kikuyu, a Mukamba, a Mkalenjin, a Mjikenda, I'm Turkana, you can live and work in any part of this country by right. <laughs> Those we, 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 we will deal with. So let me um, uh, say this now, finally. Peace, as I've mentioned, is very important. And you know we are coming from a state of insecurity, uh, of, of a crisis. Following the elections, the Supreme Court nullified the elections, ordered a repeat. We refused to go for a repeat because the IEBC refused to meet conditions we had set. Then, you know what happened? President Uhuru was sworn in. We also took an oath. <laughs> then, what now? Positions are false apart. My people said, now that you have been sworn in, let us now declare our sovereignty. Let us be, be, first take all the portraits of the president in all the build, public buildings in our strongholds, heave them and burn them, and declare our sovereignty and begin to collect taxes. I saw that this is taking Kenya to Somalia. 
because we start a conflict that can be very bloody. You remember that time already? We said no Safaricom, no Brookside, <laughs> no Nene. The, the Nene. Virko. Then, uh, on the other hand, the people of President Uhuru told him that what Rael has done is treason. Let us arrest him, check him in the prison, hang him, Mambe Kishi. <laughs> he also saw that that would create a terrible crisis. So it is under those circumstances that we met to talk. And we talked for a long time. The first time we talked for 13 hours, non-stop, from 2 p.m. to 3 a.m. Then we adjourned. Two days later we met again for six hours. So a total of 19 hours of talking. The first when we first met, we were just looking at each other. <laughs> at you, you called me a drunkard, you called me this and that. <laughs> I said, but you also called me Kimodo Muguruki. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> After aging more than an hour, nearly two hours, we now sat down to talk seriously. <laughs> and we took a journey down the memory lane to where we started. Some of it he does not know. Buru has told you how Muse Kinyata came to Kisumu. First, when we were self by toddlers in 48, he came again in 49. Then he came again. What we remember faintly is 1952. You can remember a bearded person there with a very deep voice talking. And after that, he was gone. Oneko used to live with us the same block. Then all of a sudden he was gone. The children remained, so we were playing with his children. And then now people would assemble in our house in the evening and they would be talking about our people. And Kenyatta's name was always there. That was the state of emergency period. Until then, the Jeramogi became a member of Lejiko. And then, because he was all the time teaching people about how the Kikuyus are our people. Because those days, the life was very bad. Out there in the island of the lake, there's an island called uh, Mageta. Mama were, were kept there. And they would be taken during the day by boat to come on the land to work on road construction, then taken back. Kinamuzei Baruru Kanja were detained there. And they were being kept there because it's a fair, the lake water is very deep there, and if you can swim, there's a lot of crocodiles. You will talk to those crocodiles. This is the time when they killed uh, Mamzungu, who was looking after them when they were working. This Mamzungu, his skin had some black spots, like that fish called Kamongo. So the, the loose were called him Kamongo. When he went there, they conspired and he was killed. The two people hit him with shovels and then they escaped. Then when they escaped, that's when we now saw the small planes coming around, looking around for, because they, they were searching for them. And the GSU were also brought to look for them, these, those, those prisoners. Then the radio, was announcing all the times. At Wakikuyu, Wameru, Nawaembu, Watari. 
ukona yeyote kipindi karibu piga report kwa polisi mara moja that was being repeated on radio every morning in the daytime the evening at that time then I remember our jamogi was telling the people that these people are our brothers and sisters uh, and those those people who had escaped were helped by the, the population they escaped into Busia and into Uganda. They, 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 were, they were never found. So we know where we're coming from. And this is one of the issues that we talked about. How life was very bad. The Kikuyus were being arrested and taken to emergency villages uh, and so on. And the Maumaus were, arrest, were taken to uh, Hola, Manyani, and so on. Then the Jamogi in the Legico stood up and talked. When the, the motion had been brought, when Maumaus had been beaten in the Hola the detention camp and killed, then Jamogi, who was the chairman of the African elected members, called a meeting and they agreed that the motion should be moved in parliament to discuss the issue. So when Jaramogi tried to speak, he said, Mr. Speaker, in the heart of hearts of the African people, Jomo Kenyatta and all those who were detained with him were and are the true leaders. And their continued detention offends the consciousness of our people. Jeremiah Nyaga, who was in the house there, would tell us, he used to tell us, you could have had a pin drop when Jaramogi uttered those words. Because those days he mentioned the word Kenyatta, done. Then Africa and all the other members of, 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 of Legic were there, disowned Jaramogi. They were 14. Only Masinde Muliro supported him. But Jaramogi challenged Ikiano, who was a member for Fort Hall to go for a public rally in Fort Hall, now uh, Moranga, to ask the people between him and Kian who was right. Kian of feared. But then the people of Moranga, of Fort Hall, issued a statement saying they support Jaramogi. The people of Kisumu also said they support Jaramogi. Then, after that, when now the crescendo started, then these people also now turned and they come to say, Uhuru na Kenyatta. They are saying, Uhuru first, you get Uhuru, then we release Kenyatta. Uhuru na Kenyatta. Jaramogi said, it's not Uhuru na Kenyatta, it is Kenyatta na Uhuru. <laughs> first. So you see, I know where we are coming from. I carry this pass here. This pass is called Kikuyu Embu Meru Passbook. <laughs> this was the passbook that people are to carry if you are Kikuyu, Meru, or Embu during the state of emergency. It's written here Simon Barorwa. Son of, son of Ngugi, tribe Kikuyu, location Gatanga, chief Ndungu, sublocation Rogeta, occupation clerk, age 29 years. And then he says, movement, this movement permit, from, as you need to put there, to via and then valid between at this end movement uh, permit register entry number issued at and so on you must have this to be able to move at that time this is where we are coming from so we discussed and then we said but Africans came together United, there was no Kikuyu, there was no Nini, because to Mzungu, you were just a bloody African. 
in the hotels like Norfolk, New Stanley, uh, New Avenue, there were signs written there that Africans and dogs are not allowed. <laughs> That's where we were coming from. But the unity of our people got Mzungu out. But after that, then we split. The split of the nationalist movement, because they need to know that Mugai Njijenga was telling you about Kanu and Kadu. Kanu was the nationalist movement. Kadu was actually uh, stooges of the settlers. So you need to know how the independence came. Just unity of the people, these communities that brought independence in this country. In 1961, there was an election which was done. Kanu won the elections. Kanu lost, but Kanu refused to form the government without Kenyatta. And Kadu agreed to go into coalition with the settlers. That's how you come, people like Gala, like uh, Nani, uh, Nyayo, and so on, were ministers before independence. That's what most people have not understood. Okay? But then, when the final elections came in 1963, Kanu won con convincingly. And we got independence at that time, and we became the prime minister. The differences were over the issue of land. I mentioned to you about the, those settlers. When independence was coming, they said they cannot be, live under the rule of natives, Africans. So they wanted their land, their, their farms to be bought. The, then the government did not have money. So the British government came up with a loan to uh, to the Kenya government to be used to buy out those farms, uh, outgoing farmers. That's where there was a, a, a disagreement between uh, the, the, the nationalist movement, Khan. Because there are those who agreed to just buy, take the money and buy land from, from them. But those who said no, why should we buy our own land? They took it for free. The farm did for 60 years. If anything, they are the ones who should pay us something. So this is the, the need here. The group who agreed to buy was led by Mboya, there was uh, Kiano, there was uh, Gichuru, there was Jonjo, on one side. The one that said no was led by Jaramogi, Bilder Kagia, Paul Gay, J.D. Kali, and Oneko. That was what brought the difference between Jamogi. Mze was that time between the two. Mze was, okay, and the you can You didn't know how to handle that, those differences. Until the settlers invited him to Nakuru for a meeting. And that is what compromised everything. The rest is history. Okay? So I told you, we agreed with Uru that you can bring this country back to the, where we started and unite the people of this country. <laughs> so if you stand that side and I stand this side, you can shake hands and you can bring the Kenya back. The Kenya that the founding fathers wanted. And we agreed. That's the meaning of the handshake. So I said, the founding fathers had a dream for this country, which I call the Kenyan dream. And you find it in our national anthem, stanza, first stanza. Lord of all creation, bless this land of ours. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity. Peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Okay? The most important. <laughs> plenty be found. 
that plenty was not going to drop like manna from heaven. It was going to come through the sweat and toil of our people. Create conditions through which they can create wealth so that plenty is found within our borders. And in the Bible, a country where the plenty is found is called what? It's called what? So it's not Raila who is saying it. <laughs> That's what the founding fathers wanted. They wanted us to turn this country into a kana, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? Yes. So I don't paraphrase you. We are with Kibaki, we are set down with our think tank, the National and coined what we call Vision 2030. It was aimed at transforming this country from a, mid, a third world economy to a middle income status by the year 2030, meaning nine years from today. Lapset, SEZs, the tourist resort cities, the ICT city, city in Konza, and so on and so forth. And there are so many other programs that we can, and if we follow it properly, we can transform this country. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. We know very clearly where we, we want to go. We have a very clear roadmap to get there. But you cannot get there with the level of corruption we are having today in this country. <laughs> you cannot get there that way. So that's why I say I have a dream that one day we shall get there. But I have been, I want to paraphrase Martin Luther King. That I, want to say one day that I've been to the mountain top. I've been to the Lenana Point. I've been to the Lenana Point. I've seen the glory land. I've seen the glory land. And I am convinced that together we can get there. We shall get there. Thank you. I rest my case. I invite all the directors of MKF, please. We want to give a small gift of appreciation to our chief guest, led by our chairman. Directors of MKF, please come to the podium. Directors of MKF, from here, we'll just, Your Excellency, we'll just uh, give a vote of thanks by Heli Jiroge, one of the directors, and then we have the final prayer. So, directors of MKF, Bishop Gashara, you, you come forward and say our final prayer for us. Thank you. Directors of MKF,
right. Before you go, before you go, please. Please settle down. We want to say the final words, please. Okay, um, this will be very, very quick, uh, so please give me just one minute. I just want to say thank you to all of you for honoring our invitation today.